What is club governance? Let's start by asking the question, what is club? Who can define club for me? A collection of like-minded individuals in the pursuit of a common interest. What is governance? There's one word I'd ask you to try and remember when we talk about governance, and it's to steer. So it's all of your jobs to steer the organization, is it not? The volunteers and the paid staff, collaborative governance. The industry's never been going through as much change. It's never been more important that you have a compass point to follow. And it's your job, whether you're paid or not, to steer that ship. So, whose job is it to govern the club? It's the committee's job. What we're gonna leave with today is making your governance business-like practices that will attract the right people and will repel the wrong people. There's a, a nice firm foundation for a business. That's how businesses run. Now let's have a look at how a golf club runs. There's 400 members, that's a typical number of members, certainly in a Scottish club. They elect a load of subcommittees and they elect a main committee and they elect a captain or a president. Can anyone spot the difference? Now under here what you have is a general manager, a captain or president there, and they have a course manager, a clubhouse manager, an office manager, and they have some support and they have some frontline staff. Hmm, which one of those is the most stable foundation? You've got to be completely strong to keep those two pyramids solid, particularly in difficult times. And believe me, folks, we're in difficult times right now. Why do we have a temptation to look backwards at committee meetings? Clear. It's clearer, isn't it? So what we've got to do is we've got to say, hang on. We've got to stop looking backwards and start looking forwards. And the only way you can do that is to actually share that with the board and say, enough. We're going to dedicate X percent of our time to look forward and only X percent of our time to look back. Golf clubs are notoriously guilty of driving down the middle of the road. What I want you to do is say, which side of the road do we want to drive on? And I want you to drive brilliantly on it. You just have to be able to convince me you know what your market is. And you know why? The committee that's been elected and the staff that have been employed are there to deliver that. And if you can't tell me what you're trying to deliver, I'm not convinced you know where you're going. How do they make decisions once a month? Well, imagine you were running a business, and many of you do. Do you get together on a monthly basis to make decisions? You don't. You empower people to make decisions because you've got a firm direction and you empower people to get on with that. But the way golf clubs are set up, you are required to meet, if not monthly, then certainly quarterly, to conduct the affairs of the club. When businesses have internal meetings, who do they invite to speak? Who do we invite into the room every month? Everybody. Everyone. Everyone who has something to say about everything. Do we actually invite the people who have the best contribution to make? If we're going to talk about the golf course, do we actually invite the golf course manager in? But who actually invites their pro, their course manager, their clubhouse manager to sit in attendance at committee meetings? Who does that? Who actually brings them to the management committee meeting? So you get them into the body that's making recommendations, but you don't take them to the meeting that's making approval. I'd take them to that meeting as well. That's what a business would do. A business would take the most informed people into the room to make that decision. What is the right number of people? If that is the committee, the, the ultimate committee that makes the decisions, how many seats at the table should we set for a board that needs to meet on a monthly basis to make strategic decisions or oversee the work of the management? The first seat at the table, I'm going to call them the chair. I might even call them the captain because we can cover both bases here. We are going to go to that dual thing in a minute but we'll call it the chair or the captain. I'm not fussy, president, I don't, I don't mind what you call it. And in the second seat, we'll call it the vice. And the vice would either be vice chair, vice captain, or vice president, okay? Those two should be a given. Continuity coming through the chair. Who else do you think should have a seat at this table? Treasurer. Okay, let's say finance. Who else? GM. The GM has a seat at the table, but they are in attendance because they don't get a vote, unless you're incorporated, and I believe then if you're talking about a director, maybe they do. But for the purpose of this discussion, senior staff down this side of the room. 
Green, biggest asset you have on the course. I have 60 sets of club accounts. I know the average spend. What percentage of all of your money do you spend on the golf course on average? 50%. So we better have someone up there who's responsible for 50% of our outgoings. Next seat at the table. House. House. And by house, we might mean two different things. We might mean bricks and mortar, and we might mean service. But it's house, one person. Who else needs to meet? Membership. Membership, okay. If I said of the 60 sets of accounts I've got, where do most clubs get their revenue from? Where do they most get their revenue from? Yeah. Subscriptions, okay. If I then said, no, nah, let's not move to revenue, let's just talk about pure profit. Do you know what percentage of pure profit you get, pure gross profit from membership subs? Average works out at 80%. That means at your board meetings, you're spending 80% of your time talking about how we get and keep members, is that right? So let's keep membership a seat at the table. And we'll call that marketing in brackets. One, two, three, four, five, six. Can anyone give me a seventh person who we think should be at the table? My magic number is eight, and I'll tell you why. Although there's only six people need to be in the room, eight will always guarantee a quorum, and a quorum would be five people. So at that point, I would give you the flexibility to say, for goodness sake, let's not have member without portfolio, okay? Give them a role, a meaningful role, and that is their role, but there needs to be no more than eight. How am I gonna go from 14 down to eight? By asking them how many people really need to meet on a monthly basis. And they'll struggle to get past six. Now, to make this successful, what you need is what's called the subcommittee mindset. Don't get caught up in the number. Focus on what they're there to do. A finance subcommittee, who heads up the finance subcommittee? The finance convener. Who else is there? Some kind of admin person who does the books, okay? So internal books person. Who else should sit on that committee? The finance subcommittee. Yeah. The GM, I like the GM at every single meeting, okay? So I'm gonna very cleverly put the GM across all of these meetings, okay? Why do I like the GM at every meeting? Because you need the support of the membership. You need to know what the membership's thinking. You need to hear their ideas, and you're gonna surround yourself with phenomenally clever people. So what we're doing is we're creating a subcommittee mindset of two or three or four people on finance who meet once a quarter, and they submit a report once a month, which can be written by the staff, because the staff have got the time, the volunteers generally don't, and it fits on one piece of paper. The chairman at that meeting, the monthly meeting will say, did everyone get the board report on finance? Yep, everyone read it, good. It says in there that things are looking good and that the uh, finance committee don't think anything needs to be discussed. So what level of information? One piece of paper. And one piece of paper from each of these people would look something like this. Uh, the, the heading, the strategy statement, the objectives, and the initiatives. And what are initiatives? They're just ideas. So imagine if it came in, to say it was the, the Green Committee. Uh, this is the Green Committee report. Our strategy is to provide a wide open golf course that's available to uh, family and friends because we're a beginner's golf course. The objectives, these are the measurements by which we'll judge our success or failure this year. And initiatives, these are the ideas we're gonna put into place this year. And a traffic light system, green, yellow, and red, would say, we've done it, we're on it, or we haven't started it. And at the very bottom, do you need any time at the next management committee meeting? Yes or no? And the Green Committee says no. Fast forward. The chairman, did everyone get the green report from Kevin? Yep. These guys are doing well. Yep. They say they don't need any time. Green, Mr. Green convener, do you need any time? No, I don't. Next item. What you've done is you've shifted the power base. You've shifted the discussion from this meeting. You see where we're going with this? We're involving more people in the discussion, but picking only people who have an expertise in their right area. They send a report up and the board says, we love it. The magic happens when you have a subcommittee mindset and they produce a monthly report and occasionally will ask for time at that committee to discuss something. Now we've got a 90 minute meeting where 30 minutes of it is just saying, did everyone get the report from the green? Yep, move on. What about this dual committee structure, okay? We've said we're gonna strip out the captain. So what they do is they set up a two tier system and you might then have one committee 
over here, which is captain, which includes gents and ladies and vice and vice and match and handicap and junior and lady and senior. And they all feed into this group here. And you know what the one thing they've got in common? Golf. Golf and togetherness. Nothing to do with business. It's the, the heartbeat. It's the warm soul of the club. It's crucial, but it doesn't need to be talked about around a business table. Does your club know what makes it special? The vast majority of clubs I visit can't tell me why they actually exist. It says in the Constitution, golf and associated activities. That's not cutting it anymore, folks. Pick three words that best describe your club. How confident are you that you're all pulling in the same direction? It's about saying, I need to know you know why we're here. A SWOT exercise. Put your members in the room and ask them what they think are the strengths of the club. And from that will come out several words that are strengths of the club that will jump off the page at you. And you've started to make your way towards your three words or your eight word sentence, whatever it is. Don't let the market you're in put you out of business. If there are two busloads of people on your waiting list to get in who want it the way it is, relax. But if there isn't, where are the two busloads of people who are like you, 66 year olds, waiting to get in? Because if you don't bring them in, I've got to find them. And I can't find them unless you let me turn the dials a little bit. So let's talk about if we were to turn the dials, where would we go? And from that might come the basis of a conversation at a town hall meeting. We ask them to come in, we reveal the results of the survey to the members, we ask them to give us their strengths and dare I say the weaknesses, and we say, you know there's a consistent feel coming out of the room. Could I ask the room now, is the general direction of travel to move in a slightly more contemporary or traditional direction? And you'll get instant feedback on it. And if you then want to distill that down into one question survey, all the work we've done so far would suggest that we move in this direction, yes or no. And here's examples of what yes would mean, here's what examples of what no would mean. If you open up a committee meeting discussion and say, what do you think we should do? That, that's gonna go on for days. But if you say, what do you think we should do to make the club more contemporary or more traditional or make the course more difficult or make the course easier or make the food a more rapid, fast flow food service or a more silver service, people have got the answers. But you've got to tell them where you're trying to get to. So treat your club like a sat nav. Find out where you are now, find out where you want to go, and the next bit's easy. Have you agreed smart goals? Which four dials are you constantly watching? Constantly watching to make sure you're going to achieve your objectives. What do you think the four dials should be at your club? New members, if that's your priority for this year, we need an optimum number of people to, uh, to get by. We're going to make sure that that's our number one priority. And we would therefore spend most of our time in subcommittees and main committee discussing how we get there. Green fee income accounts for roughly 19% of a typical Scottish club's gross profit. That's a big chunk. So we need to dedicate some time to it and we need to make sure everyone's aware we're pulling in that direction. If we tell the members we're pulling in that direction, they might be a little bit more sympathetic to a face on the T they don't recognize. Because guys, if you don't have visitors, your subscription's going up. Have we really communicated what we're all trying to achieve throughout the whole pyramid? And I include the members in that so that they do buy into, let's have more visitors. 80% of your profit comes from subscriptions. 19% comes from golf revenue. Have a strategy. Have a manager accountable. Give them four dials to turn and tell them to report on it monthly. Job done. Hold someone accountable for delivering, support them to deliver it, and keep your hands on the dials. If you are making a loss, make it a managed loss. Do committee members have meaningful role descriptors? Sit down with the person who's in post and say, do these accurately represent your job? If you were rewriting it, how would you rewrite it for your successor? And then crucially say, what would the skill set be you'd be looking for in your successor? Do you recruit or select your committees based on that skill set? Or do you just take who's available? This is how you do it. With a nominations committee. This is a committee that goes out 
and meets people that are new to the club or have been at the club, finds out what they do, finds out what their background is, and finds out whether or not they might be interested and in puts something back in the club. Use your captaincy and your leadership to make things better. You can start with that with an induction. And what you've got to do is you've got to start recruiting people through your nominations committee. So the only people that are coming into the boardroom you think are the right material. Then you've got to give them an induction. The bottom line is the more you can bring them up to speed and make them feel part of how we do things around here, the faster they'll hit the ground running. An induction can be used to give an overview of legal obligations and duties because some people just don't get it. You've got to do that legal bit with them. Clear definition of responsibilities and a definition of what you do, the manager does, and what the board do. Let me give you a quick example. If I was to sit the managers in this room down now and ask them to list 20 things that they have to do in a month, a quarter, or a year, it would look something like this. Okay, here's the job. So let's start with budget. And in here it would say GM role, committee role. What's the GM's role, the general manager's role in creating a budget? What does he do? Creates it. What's the board do? Approves it. Anyone in any doubt as to who does what now? All right, what about this? How about the uh, presentation of prizes event? General manager's role. Coordinate and be there. Committee's uh, role. Be there. Mix. <laughs> Hand out trophies. Find your successors. Here's the kicker. Day-to-day -day operations. What's the GM role? Everything. What's the committee's role? Zero. What will the club look like one year from now as a result of your hard work? That's an induction, folks. And a tour of the premises will round it off. The strategic planning process for me, people, uh, people mix up with, with business planning. Uh, the business plan is what are we doing this year to make things happen. The strategic plan is a more long-term view. And you're gonna need to take the members with you on that. So we're talking about survey, we're talking about town hall meeting, we're talking about capturing a, a mood and a feeling, and we're talking about a strategic away day. Taking the elected members away and saying, here's all the data you need, and facilitating a conversation that says, I think we know which direction we're going in. And then creating a plan that will help us get there. That's a five-year plan generally, because people struggle to see it longer than that. But it must include a 20-year plan on capital replacement. And that includes replacing what we have and putting money aside for what we might want. So the strategic plan is about saying, are we sure that's where we're going? We've taken all the input we can possibly get. We've followed the, the common themes. We're going to run with that. We're going to commit to that. It's not in tablets of stone, but we're running with this. And then we're going to keep the, uh, the, the managers accountable for delivering in those areas. What's the most important thing we can do at the club? It's high levels of membership satisfaction. If you are scoring consistently high levels of membership satisfaction, you've cracked it. But I've never yet found a club who does that who doesn't have excellent, robust, collaborative governance practices in place. When there's fewer and fewer people willing to buy, what's the temptation? Reduce the price. And what you've actually got to do is you've got to give people value. People join a golf club because they're invited, they're wanted. But they stay at a golf club where they're valued. Here's the value equation. We've already worked out what the C is. That's cost. The experience is how you will be judged. The only way you can increase the value of something is to either put the cost down or put the experience up. And clubs that are in trouble tend to want to put the cost down when the secret for everyone in this room is to put the experience up. Please don't lose sight of that. The most important thing at your club is not how well you run your governance, it's membership satisfaction levels. If I've got you to the point where you want to change and you want to change, you've got to convince everyone else to change. And what you've got to get people to is an acceptance of reality. And you've got to take them to the point where they say, there's a better way of doing this, isn't there? 
In a hundred years, every aspect of club operations have improved bar one, which is club governance. So what you've got to do is you've got to bring someone in. The good news is that England Golf have a field force of people who could stand up at a meeting and say, there's another way. Where can you get help? The GCMA can help you. They've got a brilliant website that'll help you. And they've got a help desk. You can ring them and just say, what would you do in these situations? If you're a member of that organization, that's available for you and the president to call. England Golf also has a website that can help you. And they've got a field force that will come out and speak to you about this subject. 